check, check, I'm good. So I'm Max Ron, Max, Max Ron, CWB Association Welding Podcast, Pod, Pod, Podcast. Today we have a really cool guest, Welding Podcast. The show is about to begin. Hello and welcome to another edition of the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max Ron, and once again, we are here with a very special guest, Matt Asseltine. He is here to talk to us about his journey in the welding trades and, and what has led him from, um, I mean, I guess from a baby to today. So welcome, Matt. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just start at the start, man. Where yeah, are you right uh, now? Where are you living? Where where you're coming into me from where? Uh right now I'm in Toronto. Um so, I'm like in the, right in Toronto? Yeah, right right down by the water in Toronto. <laughs> Holy crackers. How like, maybe I shouldn't ask how many millions you're worth, but geez, a house in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, actually, just... actually I rent out here. I don't really uh yeah. I don't plan to stay in Toronto a lot longer. <laughs> there's a lot of work, but it's not you know, uh, too busy. You know? All my friends that are out there are telling me um, about the amount of work in the GTA. Uh, like, I'm friends with a couple of iron workers out there, and, and uh, well, above and beyond, he's out there. And, man, it's just like a pile of work. You guys are going crazy. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. It's, uh, it's really, really busy out here. Like, um, I try not to work downtown in the core. Um, I try to base myself around like Mississauga and other areas. Uh, I don't really like working down there too much. <laughs> yeah, so, a little bit too congested. Exactly. I have tr- so, I have trouble with the big truck going down there too. So. Yeah, that makes sense. So, were you born in Toronto or where were you born? Uh, no, actually, I'm from Kingston, Kingston, Kingston Ontario. Ontario. So, what did you uh, What did your family do in Kingston? What was your mom and dad into? Well, I grew up on a farm out there. Oh, what kind of farm? Uh, it was a dairy farm. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's sort of where a little bit of the welding started, because there's lots of repairs and that sort of thing, and working on equipment. And still you know, still that way every time I visit. I don't get real vacation. I go and fix a tractor. <laughs> well, and, you know, that's the thing is, uh, I mean, I'm in, Sask- I'm in Saskatchewan, so agriculture is huge out here. And uh, every agricultural area, they got that welder on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. So then, you know, you grew up on a farm. Um, you probably went to, uh, I, I'm assuming here, a small town high school. Like you, you went to small town schools or were you like bust into a bigger area? Um, well, my early life, I went to school in a rural area and I moved to Kingston, like the actual city, probably uh, around the time of high school. So I went to high school in the town there. So it wasn't wasn't super rural. Like, Kingston's a fair size, so. Yeah. And now when you went to high school, um, you know, like, were you an athlete? Were you into drama? Were you were you into smoking? I don't know, like. <laughs> <laughs> well, lots of people were into smoking. Um, <laughs> I, I was, I was, uh, I was involved in music and, and um, that sort of thing when I was, when I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. And were you already, like, interested in the trades? You know, the, um, I don't know, not too many people go into high school thinking about it, but sometimes you come out of high school thinking about it. Yeah, around that time, I was a little interested in, in the trades, but I was, like I said, more on the sort of music side, and uh, that didn't come later later on until I was about 22 when I started to get into actual trade work. So, I wish well, I I'm, inter- started- yeah. <laughs> I'm interested in your music. I'm a musician myself, and I'm sure many of the people listening to the podcast are musicians as well. So what was your instrument of choice as a teenager? Well, um, I'd play guitar in uh, some like high school bands in Kingston. And then later on, when I moved to Toronto, I was a bass player for for a few bands out here. But uh, the trade sort of interfered with that quite a bit because a lot of overtime. <laughs> couldn't really make practices or anything, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So then what was what was the change? You said you finished high school thinking music, didn't get into welding till 21, 22. In those five years in between there, what's going on? What's going on in Matt's life that got you into welding? Well, 
uh, the work I was doing, I was working as a cabinet maker. So I guess I was in the trades, but not specific mm -hmm. welding. Um, that was like a, uh, a shop where they built like real specialty furniture. Like we'd take, um, oh, weeks to build like one thing. So it was kind of an interesting experience. And that's kind of where like interest in welding came because they have some small welding projects and stuff. And I started doing that. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of found I liked welding and I wanted to get involved in that. And so did you, did you go to school then? Or are you like... I'm 21 yeah. years old. I've been in a cabinet making place and I, I want to learn welding. You know, the, did you sign up for a college course or a night class or what, what was the path Actually, there? Yeah. Towards, towards the end of me working in the cabinet shop, we had them buy a small welder for little projects and I was sort of learning on my own. And after that, I went to George Brown and did a few of their welding courses. And uh, I had some friends that had a company, like their, their family had a company that worked doing boiler repairs and piping and stuff like that. And I found, I really kind of wanted to get more into that. So after I did the basic welding at George Brown, I went to another technical school and did like a piping course and okay. then got hired on to do boiler work as, a, as an apprentice. Yeah, because I, I mean, you either have to have your red seal or 3,000 odd hours, I think, to, to, to go for your, for your ASME 9, anyways, your pressure ticket, right? Um, well, the way in Ontario, it's a little different. Like there's, from what I understand, um, uh, you don't really have to be red seal to do any welding. See, this wasn't a, a union shop. Um, we just get our tickets through the TSSA and do, yeah. just do the test, but there was no like pre welder qualifications for that. You didn't have to have a minimum number of hours in order to do your initial six. No, actually. Really? Because that's something we do have out here in Saskatchewan. And I, every province, I think, has their own jurisdiction. So, Yeah, I'd like to actually learn a little bit more about that, like that whole process. Because like I said, it wasn't the shop that I was working in. It was a little bit of a strange situation. They were kind of, some guys were in the union and some guys weren't. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it may be because they focused more on the repair side. Yeah. But I know, I know in Ontario, you don't have to have any red seal or anything to get the pressure tickets. Um, you just do the tests, and the company has to have the qualifications to do it. That's yeah. what I understand. Yeah, I, I'm sure, you know, um, it's different everywhere. You know, I had, when I got my pressure ticket when I was younger, it was based on hours. And then after I got my red seal, then that was the first time I ever heard them, someone say, you can substitute your hours if you have your red seal. Otherwise, you have to prove hours. And I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. You know, because I used to teach the red seal program. It's like some of them want to come out and be pipe welders or get a rig and put together a truck and go out and do pressure and buzz, which at that time was big money out west. But now it's not as busy with that stuff. It's more structural now. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's, that's a path a lot of, a lot of young people take. And and you went straight for the pipe boiler stuff. So like I mean, that that was your bread and butter. You enjoyed doing that. I did. I enjoyed doing that. I liked. I didn't really want to do shop work. You know, I liked traveling around. I've been in every single building in Toronto. I think, and <laughs> that was that was really interesting to me when I started. And I still like. I like going different places. I don't like. Uh, if I'm on site too long, I start to get a little antsy. You know. It's <laughs> yeah. Like, uh how long were you at this company doing uh, doing this type of work? Yeah, I was there for about nine years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that took you up into your mid-30s there. Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. And after that, I went out, went out on my own. So that was when you, so, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's ballsy. Yeah, you know? I know. <laughs> One job. Sure, and... a line, you know? <laughs> so, so what? What were those things that aligned? You know, that's interesting because I started my first business young and it was pretty much a failure because I didn't have things aligned. There was a lot that both I didn't know and um, and I just didn't have the maturity maybe even professionally to do it. So, you know, your mid thirties, you've only really had one job in the trades, which can, you can gain a lot of experience through one job, but that still is kind of a, a limit, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, 
the, the jobs that we were doing, like it was, it was a lot of different piping, a little bit of structural boiler work and vessel work, and it was all on different types of sites. So it was a really, as, as far as experience, there's a lot of different things going on. So I did gain a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of knowledge about different stuff working at that place, which was great. But the things that aligned to be able to get me out on my own were contacts and I just arranged, I sort of arranged work before I left, you know, because that's the big thing is if you're going to be going out, you've got to have something to support you. And, uh, sort of made that happen before I was ready to leap off and a little bit of side work and that sort of thing, you know, just to make sure things are going good. And then yeah, once you feel comfortable, then you quit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had this conversation with a, a young guy that I'm helping mentor right now, and it actually became a larger conversation with a group of, of young welders. It's the concept of your side hustle. So as a welder, you know, I, I've been a welder since I was 17. I've had side hustle the whole time. There's always like fixing buddy's chair or welding the table or doing the lamp or, you know, going out to do corral gates or whatever it is. Welders, we have this kind of just built into our trade where even if you're working at a shop, there's always kind of some work you do off the side. When you decide to get out into business for yourself, you're looking at turning those side hustles into the main hustle. Exactly. You know what I mean? And and that's actually something that uh, some some of the young welders I've I've talked to have struggled with, because when you work for a shop, someone's giving you work, and when you get the side hustles, it kind of just pops up. But when you turn your side hustle into the main hustle, you gotta hit that pavement, boy. Like you gotta you gotta be out there and procuring work, which can be scary at times. Uh, yeah, it definitely is. It definitely is. Um... The thing with the side hustle is you never know where it's going to lead. You know, you go fix somebody's boat and they're going to be working for, say, a contracting company building houses and then they'll get you out to do other things. And, you know, one mm -hmm. thing leads to another and you definitely don't want to turn down smaller things or anything like mm -hmm. that. Like just sort of always be accepting work I found was, was helpful because one thing led to a bigger thing and led to a bigger thing. And then, you know. Yeah. And you never say no. Right. Yes. Like, you never, like, you just never say no. Uh, one of the kids I was talking to, he's like, well, I turned down a job because I didn't know if I could figure out the blueprinting part of it. I'm not that great with blueprints. It's like, okay, you never say no. Like if you have, if then ask someone for help, exactly. pay someone. Like, I mean, that's just the way it works. You got to figure it out. Oh yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's always, it's always important to ask for help, especially if you don't know what to do. Like you don't want to turn down a job. I mean, if you had problems with prints or something, the person that's giving you the prints is probably going to help interpret that. You know, like it's not, mm -hmm. it's not like, uh, it's not really anything to worry about. They're generally well, it's not a deal killer. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as you're going out on your own, what was your main kind of jobs that you were doing? You said, you know, your side hustles would lead you down these different paths. What were some of the jobs you were mainly picking up first, uh, like right out of the gate? I was doing a lot of work for a food processing company, uh, a lot of uh, kind of like stainless structural to like support machines and also doing a lot of modifications because this mm. particular place was, they have some like proprietary uh, systems and, and they're always like buying a machine, tearing it apart and repurposing it. And I sort of got involved in that. A lot of, uh, a lot of figuring out how to make things work and, <laughs> <laughs> Like and that. stainless is a good gig. Like, I mean, for the it people is. that listen to this show, they're probably sick of hearing me say it. But stainless saved my butt a lot. I used to carry all my stainless tickets and MIG stick and tag, and that got me a lot of work. It got me a lot of work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, you, you want to be you want to be versatile. You never you never know what's gonna come up. But through that place, like I did lots of different types of work there as well. Mm. And uh <clears throat> they'd have other contractors come in, we'd meet help them out, then I go on a job with them. You know, that's sort of how it works. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just one thing leads to another. And there so as go. a small business owner, for the young guys that are listening, young guys and gals and, and peoples, yes. what did you, how, how did you work the money side of it? Because actually this, came, this comes up to me all the time. You know, accounting, taxes, 
all that stuff. Did, how did you do that? Starting a company, unless did you know how to do that? Like, how did you figure that out? Not really. I mean, I started. <laughs> <laughs> I started out just learning the business side of it, and um, I found it really important to just keep up with everything, because you know you're you're busy doing work. Don't fall behind. When, you're, when your paperwork's not there, I mean, <laughs> you can get yourself into trouble. Yeah, and, and it uh, it gets heavy really quick. It does. It does. You, I mean, I do let it slide sometimes, you know, but that's a, that's a, that's a lesson I've learned. <laughs> so for the CRA listeners out there, for all the C, he's totally up to date. Everything's good. Oh, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, so you know you're you're kind of doing some stainless. You're working with uh, some food processing plants. I've I've had those gigs. I, they're lovely gigs. You yeah. know, processing tables. You know, all stainless work, sinks, tubs, connections, conveyors. You know, um, there's lots of obviously lots of agriculture, animal agriculture here in in Saskatchewan. So you know, I've built a lot of squeezes, animal squeezes, and stuff like that. Yeah, all stainless work, all fun, and you know, as those gigs dry up did you find yourself doing more structural more pipe or more like custom fab like where where did your kind of business grow into uh, i went more into piping i mean that's where yeah. i had the initial start and uh that's sort of what came up and that's kind of what i pushed for mm -hmm. structural i don't mind it like i just don't have a lot of experience in structural and um i find uh I mean, piping, I'm so comfortable with. Like, I can just take yeah. the job, just go, right? Yeah. So You know, structural is a learning curve. I, I worked in shops for a long time and did a lot of work for structural places. But then when I went and did my first tour with the iron workers, which is structural, they're the kings of structural. Oh, yeah. Right? And, and there's no denying it. They can do that faster and better than anyone else. Exactly. And I went out with the iron workers one, uh, one summer, and they asked me to cut some beams up, and they handed me their prints. And I've, I had looked at this point at thousands of prints in my life because um, I went down the fabricator stream, so I was always more of a fabricator. And so I was like, okay, no problem. I'll do your prints. And I'm looking at these prints, and there's, like, different annotations, different symbols, things I'd never seen before that are completely just for structural, like, ironwork or structural work. And I, I, it was like I was back to kindergarten in welding world. I was like, uh, what, you know, like <laughs> what it's, it's quite complicated. Oh, it is. It is. It's a, it's a different world for sure. And, um, yeah, that's why I try not to try not to do too much of that because it's not, it's not where I feel comfortable, but I do, I do the odd thing here and there. And what about repair work? I mean, that's sometimes a good gig for the for a guy with a truck, but sometimes it's uh, it doesn't it's not, it doesn't really pay the bills that well. Like, it's, what did you think? Yeah. Repair work's hard because depending on who you're working for, I mean, they can get shocked with your pricing because you're gonna come out with your truck and it's gonna take so many hours, and you're missing another job to do it, and uh, mm -hmm. they expect it a little cheaper sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, I mean, I try, I try, I try to be fair, definitely. But, um, yeah, re repair, I do some of it on occasion. It's, it tends to be like a small emergency for somebody. They'll, they'll give, they'll give me a call and I'll go out and do it, but I don't do any like large equipment, that sort of thing. Um, basically just the farm work for my family is my main, <laughs> <laughs> the main repair That's, gigs. Yeah. That doesn't pay very well at all. <laughs> <laughs> getting paid in chicken eggs and quarts of milk no. <laughs> exactly <laughs> i uh i i was looking at you know a couple friends of mine that do repair work and there's like a weird bubble in the middle where it doesn't seem to make enough money so either you do the small gigs like you're saying like for the chicken and the eggs and the and the milk and and that's fine because you know what i'll take a a, a, a supply of food any day for a quick job and that's that's fair that's part of the hustle sometimes you trade services is what we say barter right yeah but then on the high end there is those repair uh, gigs that make a lot of money but they're big jobs you know so like you're either working for excavation uh, this is an example of one of those jobs yeah. that pays well for repair excavation yeah. if you can be the repair worker for an excavation site job then you're fixing buckets you're fixing control arms you're fixing shafts those are good repair jobs that pay big money because those jobs have to get done. That bucket's got to get back on the loader and it's got to get going. 
you know, those are the kind of jobs that make you good money, but they're, they're, they're tough to get in on those jobs. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of, I mean, if you're involved with the company beforehand, it's kind of a little bit of, you know, you got to get your foot in the door in that, that sort of field before you, mm-hmm. before you get to uh, get calls. You get <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we're right at the halfway mark of the show. It's a perfect time. We'll take a quick break here for our sponsors. Thanks for the listeners for tuning in. We're going to be right back here in about a minute here with Matt Asselstein. Asselstein, did I say that right? That's right. You're giving me the look like close enough, but (laughs) Asselstein. 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 God, okay. All right, we'll be right back. So don't go anywhere and we'll be right back here. And we're back here on the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max, and I'm here with Matt. We'll keep it simple this time. And we're talking. For, he's from MCA Welding out in the GTA. And uh, we're talking about his career. So basically, we went from a small town boy outside of uh, Kitchener, I believe you said. Uh, uh, Kingston. No, Kingston, sorry. Outside Kingston, uh, from a dairy farm to moving into Kingston, then moving to GTA. He's got his company. He's right, rocking and rolling. He's had a few good gigs. Now, where you're sitting now, you know, are you, do you have staff? You got more than one truck? Like how, where's the company at? Where's MCA Weldon at right now? Well, it's just me really. I find that's a big jump to start running another truck and having employees, you know, I'm good for work, but then having somebody that you're responsible for, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I can I, see it making you nervous just talking about it. <laughs> It's so close. It's so close to that point where I could I could use like some years I could use five guys and some years it's good just with me. Right. And yeah. it's uh, I mean, I like to just I have a, a bit of a network of people in the trades and uh, how I go about that is if I need extra work, like we all sort of share work with like within within the group. And uh, that's how we deal with staffing problems for the most part. Yeah, and you know that's a fantastic thing that you bring bring up, and I love that you brought that up. The network, because that's very important for young business owners, is to have that network and don't be afraid to share work. Um, you know, you like we said earlier, you just say yes to any job, and if it's a little bit too big, you share it out. Exactly. Right? And then when it comes around and you're slow, you know, then you reach out and they'll share back. Yeah, no, that's definitely a good system to have. So how do you do your networking? Is this like just old school? You know, these people pick up the phone. Are you on social media? Are you like, you know, how do you keep up with it? Well, basically, it's just the old school way of meeting people on site and Mm -hmm. going through through that sort like that sort of way of uh, networking, you know, just like you meet somebody and you meet somebody and one thing leads to another. It's like I have like friends that I've met on other jobs that are steam fitters and different things. And they've gone out on their own too. And Mm -hmm. once that happens and they kind of become part of the groups that I work with, you know, it's like, uh, need help with that. Different electricians, different things, you know, you never know who you're going to need. Sometimes they call you back too. So, so what kind of, what kind of capabilities can you run off your truck? Like maybe walk us through what you got and and what uh, what it is that you can do. Oh yeah. Um, as far as like equipment goes, when I was working for my original job, we were very limited in equipment. So I'm kind of really into getting stuff. You know, like I, I like I like a lot of tools. <laughs> you like your toys? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, my capabilities on the truck. Uh, I run a Vantage on the truck. Lincoln Vantage, uh, so that gives me lots of auxiliary power. Mm-hmm. So I can plasma cut, run other welders. So I can do aluminum welding with other machines, that sort of thing. I'm pretty, pretty fully capable, and uh, I'm pretty stocked up for you know specialty stainless equipment, you know purge monitors, uh, dams, that sort of thing. You know, like I try to be able to do everything i can you know as far as at least in the piping fields you know yeah and carry a couple of rolls of muffler tape just in case oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of welding cable <laughs> yeah and lots and lots of welding cable yeah. 
<laughs> there's never too much. I got I got rolls of it in my backyard, and I don't I haven't gone out on a site job in 15 years. I probably still got 50, you know, probably 150 feet of welding cable wrapped up in my backyard, and I'm sure someone would love it. It's expensive, but. I- uh, <laughs> but I should probably just give it to somebody. So if anyone's listening and you're in the Regina area, I probably got some welding cable for you. <laughs> <laughs> somebody will be calling so, me shortly. Yeah, yeah, probably. I shouldn't have said that. No, I'm screwed. But um, I'm interested. You know, it's interesting that uh, where did you learn to aluminum weld properly? For the listeners that know this show, I suck at aluminum welding. It's just like my my Achilles heel. I saw that uh, one of the welding companies that I deal with. Just came out with a new welding stick electrode for aluminum. Um, I used to, way back in the day when I was working underground mining, we had a stick aluminum electrode that we would use for certain jobs. There's not a lot of aluminum in mining in general. It's too soft. But there would be the odd thing. So we would just carry like a box of these stick aluminum rods. And they were really difficult to work with. And it was ugly. Like it was an ugly mess. You're globbing it together basically. But then I seen this new rod came out and it actually looks pretty good. Like it looks like a normal bead. So I'm interested in that because I've not, e- I'm not even set up in my garage for like uh, AC aluminum uh, TIG welding. Cause I'm just like, nah, I don't care, but maybe I should. Like, how did you get into that? Well, th- there was a little bit of that that I did in school. So I mm-hmm. sort of learned a bit that way, just a little bit on plate. And then that was sort of part of me breaking out on my own i needed to do a lot of i needed to build some tool boxes i needed to do, <laughs> you know and uh it was a bit of the knowledge i got in school and practicing um a little bit of internet research but mainly practicing <laughs> um and uh keeping the important things like having it clean like that's very yeah d- dirty aluminum and a heat control because it can you'd be surprised it can just your whole piece can just turn into a puddle and disappear. Is it? Yeah, that, uh, I know. I I know that very well. <laughs> <laughs> I've had many beads fall into the depths of hell, being like, "Oh, this is going pretty good," and bloop. Oh, that I guess not. Oh yeah, I, I we did a little <laughs> bit of aluminum at the boiler place as well. I actually worked on a ship's mast for them once. Oh, that was, sounds fun. It was, but they didn't have the greatest equipment we did have an aluminum machine but the only mm-hmm. control possible was a foot pedal so oh. i was up the mast doing the foot pedal between the knees <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that was uh that was fun it worked it worked well though it was it was an interesting experience <laughs> that so so are you team foot pedal or team uh, you know um high frequency start uh i prefer hand like, remotes yeah like, do you like the hand yeah yeah i try to with with all my welding, I'm I've gotten into using remotes quite a bit. I I really like, especially with a lot of cable. You know, you want to want to be able to. Well, and some of the new machines. Well, sold. I've seen a couple of cool things. One of the new machines I saw has a monitor, like a, a you can clip it into your lead at any point, and it gives you control abilities back at the machine. So you can add another fifty feet plug it in it works at another 50 feet plug it in it works there's no secondary cable it's just right off your lead and i thought that was pretty cool and then i seen one that has a, a new welding machine that has bluetooth to oh, your yeah. cell phone and you can control all your all your um you know parameters off your machine from your phone i was like that's pretty sick that that Which... is <laughs> there's a there's a guy in um, edmonton i believe he has his own company. He makes, he does like 3D prints the remotes and does all the wiring and stuff. I've got uh, a few of his. They got like a thousand foot wireless range. Uh, you can, if you get the remote start module put in your machine, you can start and stop. It'll run the glow plugs, everything. Really? That's cool. And the, the good thing about this guy is he'll be able to do an adapter. I use that remote on four different machines, Lincoln or Miller. You know, it's not like proprietary setups and it's it's amazing well i think you're gonna have to give him a plug this sounds like a cool guy is what's uh how do you find him it's uh it's dk rw remotes i believe um i know on instagram it's uh tig ninja is is okay. his his handle, his handle there uh all right well that's very cool like you know, if he's uh, if he's doing this out of on his own i always want to promote the small business so you know tig ninja i'm gonna have to check that out yeah. I have to give him a call for the show. 
Oh, it's it, he does <laughs> amazing things, and he's always tinkering with stuff. Like, I follow his feed on Instagram, and I see, like, he's mind blowing stuff that he's just making himself. Like, he's yeah. definitely checking out. So you know, in your career now, so I'm 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 gonna go out on a limb here. I'm pinning you early 40s. I'm I'm, I'm thinking somewhere in there. So uh, how old are you? I'm, my way off. I'm gonna be 40 in uh, six days. Oh, you're a Virgo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm 46 in 12 days. All right. <laughs> yeah. So to all the people listening, if you're not a Virgo, sit down. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome you'll be 40 um you know like at, is now looking forward into your career future wise for you mca welding your family or your house or what whatever you got going on what's your vision what are you thinking you thinking just ride this out you and your truck into the sunset like uh, the littlest hobo or or are you thinking uh something else another plan teaching or any credentials or well, I mean, you can't work forever in this trade, but you can work a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with quite a few older welders. I, I'd like to keep seeing how far I can go, you know, just the way it is. I mean, mm -hmm. I may have to look into running another truck and, you know, expanding the company that way. It's just, like I said before, it's, it's that's a little daunting, but, you know. Yeah. Or finding the right apprentice that can maybe just r take over your truck a little exactly. bit, you know? Exactly. Um, but yeah, no, I'm just going to try to keep going the way things are and see how that goes. I do like, I'm always, I've always been interested in like welding learning and I do a lot of practice and like even just, you know, mm -hmm. get some titanium and try to weld that, you know, I've done a lot of that when I was, when I was younger too, you know, just practicing and learning mm -hmm. and teaching might be a possibility but uh well like you know every everywhere i talk to there's a shortage of welding teachers it seems to be a tough gig to hire for you know so that's um you know i think that that'd be something that's cool and uh, i taught for seven years i loved it honestly i'd still be teaching if i wasn't uh if i wasn't doing this you know so uh sometimes i miss it i i miss it's it's not like the institution or anything, but you miss the students, you know, you miss you miss seeing that student show up that's got that glow in their eyes and you know they're really loving welding. And you're like, Yeah, that's the man that's the guy right there. He's gonna go far, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's the competition like in your area for, for a welding truck? Is it hard to to get out there if you're looking for work? Is there a lot of trucks rolling around? Like I know you said there's lots of work, so yeah, there's there's quite a few. There's quite a few like single guy companies, and uh, I don't know. Like it's it's hard to say. Like I run into a lot of jobs where they'll have you know four or five people like me on site, right? Because mm -hmm. um, the bigger like we're all just subbing for the larger companies, you know. Yeah. Uh, working with their company welders, and then they get too much work, and then they get us. So. Yeah, it's it's not too bad. It's not it's not too bad. Like I, it's not I mean, saturated. There's plenty of work to share as long as yeah. you get in to know where to get it, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not gonna give up that secret. Eh? Like, yeah, well, it's, it's no, just don't a do bit that. Of networking. That's it's just what you gotta do. It's like we talked about earlier. You just mm -hmm. gotta meet people. That's it, really. And now, what what about like in you know as a forty year old or almost forty year old? Sorry, um, as a as a veteran thirty nine year old, uh, what's what? How do you fit in with like the the Instagram and Facebook and social media world? Are you are you into that? Do you because do, I you know you do have an Instagram page. You know, yep. are you is that part of your work now as well? Do you maintain that like on purpose? Uh. I like I like the sort of community of it where people are sharing work. Um, I don't participate in too many, you know, online conversations about anything. Uh, I really like following people that are sort of local and kind of seeing what's going on. And I think that's tends to be like the people that follow me on Instagram. It's sort of like people are just interested in what's going on in the welding industry and especially in their area. It's kind mm -hmm. of kind of neat to see or you're like somebody posts a picture and you're like, oh, I work there. And 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It's, and that's actually how I got you, right? Yeah. One one of my listeners was like, hey, interview this guy. Super nice. And I was like, ah, okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, it's not It's not like something that I do for my business. I like to put it, I like to put it up, you know, just short, sort of show the work that I'm doing. But it's not, uh, I don't think I really get any business from it or anything. But it's, you know, it's. It's fun. Participate in that, yeah. Yeah, no, I uh, I go down the rabbit hole sometimes on on social media where I'll find myself going in deep, and you want to sometimes comment. And I'm a really positive person. I don't like being negative ever. So it's like, oh, that's great. That looks good. And and then there's always going to be positive and negative commentary, which that's what always turns me off of social media. It's exactly. Like, you know, that that's what kills it for me because in a normal conversation, if you're in a room of people, no one's going to be that negative because that's not fun, right? But online, you'll have these weird negative comments. It's like, oh, do we really have to do that? Can't we just have fun here? Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I see, like, a lot of things where people are weld shaming, you know, like the... <laughs> oh, that's a word. I've never heard of that, <laughs> weld shaming. Well, there's there's another... <laughs> there's a hashtag for it, you know, the, the hammered, hammered dog shit or whatever, like, Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm um, learning things. I'm learning things now. <laughs> uh, I, I tend to not like that. Like, I mean, you don't know. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't know who actually did it. You don't know the situation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes things aren't pretty, and sometimes they got to get done. I mean, yeah, some, we've all been there. Well, I agree, but. <laughs> well, and in, industry works itself out. Right. It, it's not going to be you that changes that person's weld or life or career. Um, if someone actually welds that poorly, they probably won't be a welder for that long. So don't worry about it. Like, exactly. You never know. It might just be some maintenance guy that got called over to do it in an emergency. He's like, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. And then then somebody takes tries, it yeah. puts it on the Internet. And it's like, oh, this is so terrible. But you never <laughs> You never know. I mean, and we get work fixing that. So yeah, and you know that's it's. I love that you brought that up to the the shaming part of it because there's a whole part of social media that I will refuse to participate, and it's people like shaming other people on how they make money or how they work, right? And it's like don't don't do that. People people decide for their own lives how they want to make cash, and that's totally their call. If you don't like it, you don't do it. But don't make other people try to feel bad because this is how they make their money. Like, I mean, that's, I wouldn't like it if someone said that to me, you know? Of course not. You know, yeah. hey, Matt, you're running your company wrong. What did, get out yeah. of here. You know, like, I mean, it's working well for me, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it's. All right, so, you know, to wrap up the, the interview, we always kind of go over the same um, question that I'm going to ask you. And, and I think that, You'll have any perspective because you got into business fairly early on uh, in your career, you know, with only like what you said, nine years of experience before you struck out on your own. What would be a piece of advice that uh, 39 year old Matt would give, uh, you know, 22 year old Matt, you know, what, what would be a piece of advice going into this career of, you know, work with your truck and, and for yourself and your own business that, you know, someone's listening. What can you tell them? What would help them out? Well, I mean, I'd say, you know, always try to learn something new, you know, don't turn down a job just because it's not exactly what you're comfortable with and uh, be nice and friendly and meet people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it'll, it'll get you a long way. Yeah, being nice and friendly does go a long way. It's, uh, it's you remember who's not nice to you. Exactly. You really do, right? When someone's rude or short or what did i see the other day someone asked someone for a price on steel and they got back to them saying you know your company's too small we don't want to take your work uh you don't order enough and i was like oh man that's a terrible way to like maybe just say you're too busy or you know you could have said that a hundred ways better other than that and now that's not going to help your company right no not at all <laughs> <laughs> you're like oh a bad move <laughs> exactly all right, Matt. Well, I hope you had fun today. Um, I hope to, you know, I, I'm out in Milton um, every few months. Uh, that's where my office is when I head down to my office in CWB. So, uh, you know, follow me on Instagram, AskMax75, and and then you'll see when I'm out there and we should uh, meet up for a, a coffee or a beer or something. I, I'm trying to get a big group. 
because finally someday these restrictions will all lighten up and then all these awesome people that I've interviewed and met out in the GTA, we should all get together and go do karaoke or something fun. I can't <laughs> wait. Do something something social again. Exactly. That'd be great. Awesome, man. Well, any shout outs you want to hit up to anybody? You want to say hi to anyone that's listening? Uh, not really. I mean, just all right. <laughs> I don't know, let's say hi to my customers, basically. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Matt loves you. MCA Welding loves you guys. <laughs> awesome. And, uh, well, well, I'd actually like to I'd actually like to mention uh, the guy that I started to work with, uh, Tony Watson. I think he just retired this year. And uh, yeah, happy retirement. And uh, I'll tell you to listen to this because you're probably not even on the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tony. And, you know, maybe, you know what? Shout out to all the mentors, all the guys out there that yeah, help exactly. the young people get started. All right. All right. Well, take care, Matt, and we'll talk soon. And um, for all the listeners out there, thank you for tuning in. We got lots of exciting stuff coming up. I'm going to be out uh, doing some on remote recordings in the next few weeks. So that should be really interesting since it's new for me. We'll see if I don't screw that up. And then, uh, and then just stay tuned and keep downloading and keep sharing. Love you guys. Take care. We hope you enjoy the show. You've been listening to the CWB Association Welding Podcast with Max Cerrone. If you enjoyed what you heard today, rate our podcast and visit us at cwbassociation.org to learn more. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions or suggestions on what you'd like to learn about in the future. Produced by the CWB Group and presented by Max Herman. This podcast serves to educate and connect the welding community. Please subscribe and thank you for listening.